the Dean of Academics for CGSC and the Chief Academic Officer for Army University. And uh, according to the National Defense Magazine, the Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth, speaking alongside with the Army Chief of Staff, General James McConnell, during a Hudson Institute event said the following, while the Army is operating in Europe to monitor Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, it has not taken its eye off the ball in the Indo-Pacific. The Army should be able to monitor the threat of the conflict with China and deter aggression in the European theater. Well, China's response to the open aggression against a sovereign European country was that Russia's security concerns are legitimate and should be taken seriously and addressed. Our response at the Command and General Staff College is to continue focusing our efforts on China as our pacing threat and Russia as the imminent threat to our national security through conducting panels, faculty development seminars, and professional forums to enhance our understanding of the strategic motivations of those, these two global adversaries are absolutely critical. Today's panel is CASO's fifth in that direction. So the topic of our CASO panel today is Strategic Implications of China's Global Power Projections. Our panel is sponsored by the United States Army Cultural Area Studies Office, CASO, at the Command and General Staff College, and is conducted in conjunction with the United States Department of, States, of State and the United States Army Combined Arms Center International Liaison Program. Based on feedback from the previous panels, and given that we have three speakers today, instead of the usual four, we'd like to provide a short introduction of the panel members, as well as the moderator. Colonel Michael Kupp assumed the position of the German LNO at CAC in November 2021. He is an educated German general staff officer and served during his career in various command positions and in staffs at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. Colonel Kupp's operational deployments include two deployments in the Balkans in support of the K-4 mission and one deployment to Afghanistan in support of the ISAF mission. Colonel Kupp earned a diploma in social sciences from the University of the Bundeswehr in Munich, a master's degree of political science from the University of Haifa, and a master's degree in strategic studies from the United States Army Command and General Staff College. He is married, has three children, and he's a repeat offender. This is his second tour here in uh, CAC, used to teach in DTEC, so we're glad, glad to have him. Mr. Ter Terry Mobley is the Commandant's Distinguished Chair of Diplomacy at the Army's Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He is a career Foreign Service Officer and has served with the Department of State for over 20 years. He has a broad range of experience in the Indo-PACOM region, having served in China, Indonesia, Laos, and Taiwan, and served in Wuhan, China, previously. Lieutenant Colonel Paul Mustafa is a graduate of the Royal Military College, uh, Duntroon. He is a Royal Australian Engineer who has commanded at troop, squadron, and regimental levels with Australian Special Operations Command, as well as a range of staff officer appointments in both Special Operations and Forces Command. He has also served in the military attache staff in the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C., and is currently posted as the Australian Army Exchange Officer through the Department of Joint Interagency and Multinational Operations at the United States Army Command and General Staff College. The complete bios of the panel members and the moderator can be accessed on the CASO website. This event is open to all military and civilian employees on Fort Leavenworth. For outstations, the event is available live on CGSC's Facebook page and also via video teleconference. The panel scheduled until 1500 or 3 o'clock Central Time is unclassified and will be video recorded for viewing later for those who are unable to attend. The opinions and discussion points during the session are those of the speaker and the moderator and do not necessarily represent official positions of the United States or the respective partner nations. After the initial remarks for about seven minutes, our panelists will jointly answer your questions and reply to your comments. Our moderator today is the famous Dr. Mahir Ibrahimov, or Dr. I, who's the director of the Cultural and Area Studies Office, United States Army Command and General Staff College. He was previously the first senior Army culture and foreign language advisor. Mahir served in the Soviet Army as a deputy field commander and witnessed the breakup of the Soviet Union. Dr. Ibrahim, Ibrahimov also provided vital assistance to the United States forces in Iraq as a multilingual cultural advisor. 
Previously, he supported Chief of Staff Army study, which required him to travel to Ukraine and provide follow-on recommendations to Army leaders. By recent invitation of NATO's Partnership Consortium, Dr. Ibrahimov has lately traveled to several European countries to assist with NATO's part policy development based on his extensive regional expertise. Mahir is the author of several books and numerous other publications, including in foreign languages. His latest, his fifth, Across Cultures and Empires, gained significant international traction among scholars public and, movie, and the public and movie industry. He is fluent in multiple languages and culture. Behind me are a series of books that we have, which also include uh, the uh, reader from the uh, uh, from Military Review for China. And so these are available for you to take if you'd like. So please feel free to take these and look at them and take them away with you. I think they're quite excellent, every one of them. Um, Mahir is married with one daughter who is an active duty officer with the United States Army. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Ibrahimov, who will continue moderating throughout the session. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir, for your support. How's everybody today, by the way? Everybody's doing well? OK, great. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our next CASU session. As we continue closely following the regional and global geopolitical trends, obviously, the Russia-Ukraine conflict still dominates the international relations and the world media. In order to continue staying relevant, we address this very pertinent and timely topic, its potential implications for Euro-Atlantic security, as well as the Sino-American relationships during our last session in March. Depending on how the situation continues to unfold, we might conduct another session on May 25, and likely from the perspective of China's strategic approach to the conflict and lessons it might have learned from it. That makes sense or it doesn't make any sense? It does? Okay. Now, in the meantime, we continue with a series of independent panels to address the challenges posed by China through its global power projection, which is characterized by our senior leaders as a pacing threat compared to an imminent threat by Russia, which was clearly demonstrated by recent events in Europe. Okay? So I kindly ask our distinguished and very knowledgeable uh, panel that by the end of today's discussion to make sure that we can solve all these issues. And they promise to do that. So with this, and without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Colonel Michael Kopp, German Army, who will discuss the strategic implications of China's global power projection from a European perspective, which in his opinion has to be analyzed within the complex relationships between the European Union and China. Colonel Kopp, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rai. And thank you for inviting me to this distinguished panel. And I will provide you the perspectives of the European Union towards today's topic. And I would like to start with the question, what does Chinese global power projection mean? And I would like to bring back to your mind that it's geared towards specific ends. So first of all, the powerful and prosperous China says it is equipped with a world-class military. And then secondly, of course, safeguarding the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. And then the destruction of the US slash Western international order. And last but not least, the reunification with China, which is then the finalization of the one China policy. In order to achieve these ends, China, China is playing the long game. We have to acknowledge that. And it's harnessing an array of economic, foreign policy, and security tools. So we have seen that China is flexing its military muscles, 
and expanding its military reach, establishing territorial claims, especially in the South um, China Sea, and it's using the Global and Belt Road Infrastructure Initiative towards its strategic ends. And finally, we have also seen that China is crushing democratic base movements in Hong Kong and playing a destructive role in international organizations. So next slide, please. From a European perspective, the strategic implications of China's global power projection have to be analyzed within these complex relationships between the EU and China. And they can be sometimes defined as with each other, as well as side by side, but more often in the light of current events against each other. What do I mean by that? So China is, of course, a partner still in areas where we have mutual interest, like, for example, climate change, handling of North Korea, because the Chinese government, of course, have some, has some influence and leverage towards the North Korean regime, keeping Iran under the nuclear threshold, and, of course, also, the Chinese government is in the driver's seat providing access to the important Chinese market. China is as well as a legitimate, legitimate competitor in the economic domain. So in terms of free trade, of course, it's a consumer's choice if it's choosing European products, US products, or even Chinese products. And of course, we are competing regarding natural resources and in the area of research and development. However, based on its actions, China is also a systemic rival. Based on values and human rights situation in China, also we have seen some predatory economic actions in terms of intellectual theft and um, the taking over strategic industries and of course destabilizing the prerequisites for free trade and free navigation. And we have also seen some hostile actions in terms of cyber attacks which can be clearly linked to China and delegitimization of international uh, organization in, in the international order. Currently, China is from utmost importance for the European Union in the economic domain. The Chinese uh, markets provides opportunities, but of course it generates, it generates also some dependencies. So I give you just a couple of, uh, of, of data. So the exchange of goods between China and the European Union had 2021 a value of 696 billion euro. So roughly 750 million US dollar. This means 60% of the whole European goods traffic is done with China. With the US it's 15%. So it exceeds over 1%. So the trade with China has tripled with the European Union since 2000. So, and there is a significant trade deficit with China from the European Union. So 22% of imports and 10% of exports going from the European Union towards China. So, and we have seen some dependencies, especially during the COVID crisis. And still, this is on, because if you see the, in the news, the traffic jam of container ships in front of the harbor of Shanghai. This has an impact on our daily life regarding the economic domain. Next slide, please. So you, but I would like to come to the point, ukraine russian war as a catalyst for the relationship towards China. So trust is towards China in decline. And this is based uh, on the China's response towards Russia's invasion and is a scene from the European Union as a litmus test and Beijing is obviously failing. So we have seen already before the war, there was a so-called 5,000 word statement between Putin and uh, President Xi Jinping, and they called it limitless friendship. And even when the war started in March 2022, there was a meeting between uh, both foreign ministers, Lavrov and the Chinese, his Chinese counterpart, and they talked about strengthening the strategic partnership even during the war. and. Um, it is obvious that China puts the desires of a marauding dictator above its trading in diplomatic relations with the West currently. From this perspective, the Ukraine-Russian war was also a wake-up call for the relationship towards China for the European Union. And uh, this has 
brought some profound change regarding policies and perception of the political environment by the European Union. So we have seen the Versailles Declaration on 10th and 11th of March 2022, the last informal EU summit where EU member states uh, decided to take more responsibility for their security and take further decisive steps to towards building our European sovereignty, reducing dependencies and French uh, President Macron even talked about a redesign of the uh, European architecture. And the key dimensions have been uh, addressed in bolstering European Union defense capabilities, redu reducing EU energy dependencies, and building a more robust economic base. So, bottom line is that space for cooperation has significantly shrunk based on this uh, uh, outcome of the or the impact of the ukraine russian war and um, however this multifaceted approach is still kind of the official policy from the european union but um, we will observe this um, next slide i'm coming to the conclusion so of course china and chinese economy matters just the sheer numbers um, I, I told you already the figures. However, also China is watching the power of the international and especially the transatlantic unity, which has been built during this conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And the uh, Russia-Ukraine war was certainly a wake-up call for Europe. So EU is moving towards a more power-oriented policy and strategic approach. So the high representative of EU foreign policy, Joseph Borrell, said Europe has to learn the language of power. And uh, there is therefore a reassessment of EU-China relations. And of course, there's also a requirement for solidarity with the United States as well with nations within the Pacific region, which are also European Union partners. However, we have to be aware of the Chinese perception because Chinese perception is of course the West is targeting China next. And this will have also an outcome how China will react and behave. Finally, I would like to show you, next slide please, um, two quotes, and perhaps this can trigger some discussion uh, afterwards because it's kind of some different polls regarding uh, our actions towards China. On the one side, a statement from Mr. Januzzi, uh, regarding China and more uh, kind of aggressive approach based on a statement from the uh, retired Gen German general uh, Lothar Domröse, based on, of course, current um, events, what happened in, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much, and back to you, Dr. Rai. Thank you, Colonel, for the great presentation. Uh, next slide, please. The next speaker is Mr. Terry Mobley, U.S. Department of State, who will discuss China's Belt and Road Initiative, we, uh, uh, acronym is BRI, usually right, focusing primarily on countries in China's near abroad, including Cambodia, Myanmar, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. He will explain, while the initiative is important not only to support China's domestic economy, but also to China's desire to project power. Mr. Mobley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. I appreciate it, and thank you to the uh, Command and General Staff College for allowing me to participate on this panel. Uh, just to restate, uh, my views are my own, not, do not represent the U.S. Department of State necessarily. Um, I'll begin just by saying that uh, I have great respect for the Chinese people, uh, especially my wife. Uh, and she's tolerated me now for 25 years, and no, she did not coerce me into saying that. So I just want you to be aware of that. Um, I'd like to begin with a quote. Uh, some of you have heard me share this once before, but uh, Dr. Mohan Malik at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies wrote uh, in the Journal of Contemporary China, I believe in 2017, that China's goal in its foreign relations is not usually conquest or direct control, but freedom of action, economic dominance, and diplomatic influence through coercive presence. I think that's uh, absolutely correct. Um, and I think the Belt and Road Initiative, which of course was originally referred to as the One Belt, One Road Initiative, 
is evidence of that. Uh, the ability of the Chinese Communist Party to be the deliverer of growth and prosperity for its citizens and ultimately to overcome century, uh, uh, China's century of humiliation dating from 1839 to 1849 is dependent upon uh, the party's ability, the country's ability to continue its economic growth and to go abroad and secure the metals, the minerals, uh, the energy, and the influence that it needs. And when I say influence, I mean the influence that it can wield within regional and international institutions through the favorable votes of, for example, BRI partner countries. So economic growth and development is necessary for the survival of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a key element uh, of achieving that growth as well as gaining the freedom of action, the economic dominance, and that diplomatic influence that Dr. Malik had referred to. So the Belt and Road Initiative, many of you may know, was launched in 2013. This was a key initiative from Xi Jinping as he just shortly after he came into power. Uh, and again, intended to promote the continued economic growth uh, while building influence and connectivity with other countries abroad. Uh, or some may, see, uh, may say to promote other countries' dependency on China. And again, that's, that's potentially all about uh, winning over favorable votes in various regional and international institutions. Uh, again, that's a, it's a very important part of Xi Jinping's more aggressive foreign policy. The Belt and Road Initiative was incorporated into China's constitution in 2017, um, after which you noticed a change in the statements coming out from some lenders, uh, Chinese commercial banks and so forth, that were previously a little, you know, willing sometimes to complain about some projects, some BRI projects that they did not expect to result in a return on investment. Of course, after it was written into the Constitution, any complaints about um, projects or a lack of return on investment would be seen more likely as, as a, an attack on the, on the party itself. So, so there's been less outspoken comments about those things. Um, but again, even when, uh, even when projects do not result in significant financial returns for China, uh, they still serve geopolitical interests. There's well over 100 countries that have uh, signed on to the initiative in some form. Although the U.S. and China are strategic competitors, I think it would be a mistake to characterize the Belt and Road Initiative as all bad. Uh, I think painting with broad brush strokes is the wrong approach. And there are times when praising positive actions is the right thing to do and criticizing negative actions is the right thing to do. So the Belt and Road Initiative, it offers infrastructure investment in countries that have serious infrastructure needs and often no other funding sources to rely on. But again, um, you know, there are major criticisms associated with the, uh, with the initiative, and some of those include the fact that China often rely or requires, almost always requires, uh, a significant uh, portion of equipment and materials used for projects come from China, as well as labor, uh, and that has been a sticking point uh, with many countries. Um, if countries' leaders make bad deals, uh, you know, that can certainly lead to a level of dependency on China that, can chi that China can leverage and has and will use to its advantage. Um, I believe there are potential opportunities for the United States uh, on the sidelines of related to Belt and Road Initiative projects. Um, again, you've seen some countries where uh, they have pushed back on China when China wanted to both maintain and operate projects that, that they funded. Um, and I think there are opportunities, again, for the U.S. to step in and help build some local capacity so that you, you actually see improvements among the local population and the ability to, to run and operate their own uh, infrastructure. Slide two, please. When you look at China's domestic and foreign policies, it's important to recognize that the number one interest of China's leaders is for the Chinese Communist Party to survive, as my colleague mentioned. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has worked hard to make sure Chinese citizens see China's great rejuvenation, as they call it, and the achievement of the Chinese dream as being delivered by the party itself. And they've made significant progress, frankly. Uh, therefore, the, the ability of the CCP to survive is most directly related to the ability to continue to grow and provide economic opportunity for its citizens. And that's, of course, dependent upon outlets for Chinese products, including from state-owned enterprises, uh, 
you know, you think about some heavy industry like steel production and so forth that is uh, key to infrastructure uh, projects, as well as, of course, energy, mineral, and other inputs from abroad. And it's worth noting that if you think about rare earth minerals, China controls around 80% of the world uh, supply. Uh, I think 98% or so that goes into the EU is coming from China, and around 80% that the U.S. utilizes is coming from China. And these are these are key for those green technologies that uh, that we like to talk about. So, um, I think it's important for people outside China to realize that for most Chinese, they're pretty content with the development that has occurred and they're generally willing to overlook some of the more authoritarian internal controls, uh, such as the social credit system, uh, party training, surveillance, and so forth, so long as they continue to see their lots in life improve. Some academics have argued that uh, with China's rapid economic growth of the past few decades beginning to slow, there's a short window of opportunity for China to make some inroads uh, overseas to secure uh, certain geopolitical aims and I would argue most particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I think there's truth to that argument. So in that vein, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative could be seen as developing that connectivity, that economic and political advantage, um, while China is essentially in, in a situation where they can afford to self-fund many of the large-scale projects. Again, some projects may not see a financial return on investment, but almost certainly will see uh, a return on investment in terms of energy access, security, and influence. Uh, next slide, please. So South and Southeast Asia uh, are central to China's economic and security interests. And I, I say this because uh, China has long been concerned about um, the ability of hostile powers to block um, their supplies going through the Malacca Straits. Uh, they refer to this as the Malacca Dilemma. Uh, the roads, the rail, the pipelines to the west of the Malacca Straits significantly reduces the potential uh, impact of such an occurrence and port access on both the east and west sides of the Straits in Cambodia and Myanmar and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, uh, as well as the islands that they have militarized in the South China Sea are all part of protecting uh, their energy and, and supply routes through there, or being able to bypass uh, the Malacca Straits should it be blocked. Uh, China is definitely angling to be the preeminent power in Asia, and I think uh, we'll feel a sense of status and consistency until that, uh, that status is fully uh, achieved and generally recognized. Looking back on our own history with the Monroe Doctrine, I, I don't think China's ambitions in their own region should be a surprise to any of us. Uh, still, as all, everybody knows, their ambitions and, and those of the U.S., those interests of the U.S. are clearly at odds with each other uh, in many cases. Um, in China's near abroad, uh, stepping out of, of Southeast Asia and South Asia for a moment, several South, uh, Central Asian nations are also of significant importance uh, for both road and rail connectivity as well as energy supply reasons. So, for example, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, they're all rich in hydrocarbons. Uh, and three of these countries border China. Um, and they're, they're key to improving the economy and the connectivity of China's most northwest province, Xinjiang, uh, which also links up to Pakistan through uh, roads uh, and rail and uh, pipelines and so forth. Uh, of course, as China projects power, uh, its interest will likely rubble, ruffle the feathers of some, including, including Russia, which they recently just uh, signed this uh, friendship agreement with, uh, as well as India, which of course also have significant interest uh, in history in Central Asia. So while I focused on South and Southeast Asia primarily, uh, and also noted China's near abroad to its West and Central Asia, uh, it's important to note that the Belt and Road Initiative is not constrained by historic Silk Road land and sea routes. Um, it's, you know, essentially any country that wants to partner in this regard can. Uh, and those countries that uh, are the healthiest, of course, are in the best position uh, to avoid uh, excessive dependency. And those countries, of course, that are most in need of funding and can't get it from someone else are, are most likely to be overly dependent and, and willing to bend to China's will. So I think it's important for the U.S. as a strategic competitor to serve as a good hedge 
um, against China when they overreach, and they have and will continue to, I believe, in some regards. So I will stop there and turn it back over to you, Dr. I. Thank you very much, Mr. Mobley, for a very informative presentation. At this time, we are going to have another fascinating presentation by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Mustafa. Australian Army will be talking about the differences and balancing of power projection in competition and cooperation, as well as the role climate change can play in focusing on great power cooperation. Colonel Mustafa, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dr. I. If we could go to the first slide, please. So last time I spoke on this panel series, I closed with this slide. And I just wanted to bring it back up just to kind of set a frame for some of the other um, points that I'd like to make uh, in the next few minutes. Um, we, we focus in a lot on competition. And I think it's important just to understand that competition itself is neither inherently good or bad. Um, it's really about how power is being projected into the competition space and whether that's positive or negative um, competition that's being sought. Um, so to analogize it, you know, if you think about the case between, say, rival football teams, so when you have competition between the rival football teams, both teams are trying to make themselves better to beat the other team when they play. Um, if you contrast that, though, towards, say, like a rival gangs, so rival gangs will go out and attack each other, try and beat the other party down to the point where they can be the victor. So I think it's an important distinction to make when we think about competition itself being neither inherently good nor bad, but how you want to compete. Um, and as we think about what's happening across the competition, competition spectrum at the moment, um, it does appear as though the vast majority of the competition that's occurring is being focused more towards the negative, the rival gang analogy, rather than the positive, the competing football teams. So as we think about trying to control things within that competition space, um, as you move more towards conflict, uh, I think it's important to uh, have something analogous to the idea of guardrails. So guardrails, and it's not a new idea, it's a, it's a, a dig up from, from the Cold War era, insofar as you've got systems in place whereby you have a better control over how the other competitor is viewing and seeing behaviours that are occurring inside of that competition realm. Um, there's a psychological phenomenon known as uh, na naivety bias uh, or naive realism insofar as you believe that the other people all around you and the other people across the world will view things in exactly the same way that you view them. Um, and unfortunately, that is just not the case. It's not even the case inside of CGSC, where I as an Australian would see things exactly the same as Americans. So I think it's unfair to expect that um, another very different country with very different cultures and values is going to see things in exactly the same way that the West does. So establishing a series of guardrails is going to be pretty critical as we try and limit that push further and further towards that conflict side of the spectrum. Um, down towards the other end, as, as you try and um, break out of competition and move into cooperation, um, what I think we need to be looking for are circuit breakers or focal points. Um, so these are things, you know, as you look at the slide there, um, identifying things of such significant mutual interest that you can actually break out of competing with each other and move into a phase of cooperation. Um, and a little bit later on, I'll talk about one of the potential options that exist for that. Um, if we could go to the slide, please. So just to kind of contextualize this a little bit more, um, what I've done is I've, I've built two different cycles uh, up, on the board, up on the screen there. Um, the first one, the one on the left, uh, that's really focusing in in the competition space uh, and focusing in on the military element of national power. Um, so what you have in, in international relations theory, it's a pretty common, uh, commonly known phenomenon, the security dilemma. So I feel threatened, so I build up my military power, which then makes you feel threatened, so you build up your military power, and we go back and forth, back and forth, until such point as potentially there's conflict that breaks out. Um, there are obviously ways we can avoid moving into that conflict, you know, the guardrails that I spoke about earlier, but it's not a de-escalatory approach, right? It's definitely further over into that negative competition than it is positive. 
Um, if you move on to, over onto the right hand side, you can see there a more cooperative uh, cycle. So here you have an issue that comes up, you reach out and try and engage through diplomacy, that diplomacy is responded in kind, there's a compromise that's achieved, and then off the back of that compromise and the increase in relations that's occurred, you then find space to get after other, perhaps uh, issues that have perhaps less of an overlap in interests. Um, so on the left hand side, something more akin to a vicious cycle, on the right-hand side, something more akin to a virtuous cycle. Slide, please. So uh, up front, I borrowed the uh, inspiration for this analogy from David Kilcullen. He is an Australian, though, so I feel like it still stays within the theme. Um, so uh, David Kilcullen, he'd spoken about um, the idea of a graphic equaliser. Um, and for the younger people in the room, I've put a picture of it up there so you know what a graphic equaliser is. Um, but picture, if you will, a graphic equaliser that has four levers on it, okay? And each of those levers is labelled diplomatic, informational, military, economic. As you move those levers up, you're attempting to have more cooperative or positive engagement with them. As you move the levers down, you're attempting more coercive or negative engagement. Now imagine that those levers have a rubber band placed around them. So as you try and move them, if they all stay relatively in the same area, be it up or down, there's not a lot of tension on the band and you can kind of have a little bit of play around in the margins. But if you try and move, say, three up and one down, you can see the tension that starts to come on the band. And this is the real challenge you have when you think about projecting power. What's going to get spat out the other side, be it hard power, soft power, smart power, sharp power, whatever uh, label that you want to put on it, it's really going to be shaped by your ability to array those. And the further apart they go, the more difficult it is and the more tension is on trying to achieve the goals across those different elements of national power. Now, the US has been doing this for quite a long time. Um, China in its current guise, perhaps less so. And so perhaps as we look at the way that China is trying to project power globally at the moment, um, we should think about the fact that they are not as experienced in doing this as potentially the US is. And so every time they do something that's perceived as threatening, that may not necessarily be exactly what it is that they're trying to project. Slide, please. So I wanted to try and end on a bit of a high note or a positive note. Um, and that is what, what could be one of those potential circuit breakers that exists out there. So uh, it's relatively clear, particularly from a lot of both the formal language and a lot of the surveys that have occurred, that um, both the US and China see that climate change is a really significant issue, a growing issue. In fact, it's an issue to collective security, not just at the national level, but internationally. And it actually represents a bit of a historical inflection point whereby we finally have such a threat to collective security on the global scale that the only way to address it is to evolve what we think of as collective security to be treated globally. This, I think, could be the circuit breaker. And in fact, when you go and have a look at the data, um, there's actually more people in China, percentage-wise, obviously there are more people in China, but there's more people in China percentage-wise who really see climate change as a pressing issue. And so when we think about how we want to array what our national interests are, how we want to prioritise getting after those different interests, I think there's, there's a, a, lot, a great deal of scope to get after this problem set and help de-escalate some of the movement towards the bad end of our competition spectrum. Go over the last slide, please. So I just want to end on a bit of a plug slash uh, highlight some thoughts that are more articulate and better than mine. Um, so in February of this year, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute released a report. Um, the title of it you can see there. It's open source. You can go and Google it, pick it up. Um, but it is one of the most well-researched and comprehensive reports on what impact uh, climate change is going to have to security, not just within the Indo-Pacific, but certainly far beyond that. Um, pulling all the latest data from across uh, the scientific community and having that funneled through the lens of one of the premier think tanks in Australia. And so I do strongly encourage you to go and grab a copy of that and have a look um, 
to get a better sense of where we're heading if we're not able to prioritize this issue. And with that, back to you, Dr. I. Thank you so much, Colonel Mustafa, for very interesting analysis. So we are blessed with our speakers, the scholars always, they're really, really do, doing a good job. Um, uh, now, so the next stage is the most fascinating, we know it's very popular with our audiences, Q&A, questions, answers, and comments session. So this is the slide. Please introduce yourself, ask a question, or make a comment. Since the session is video recorded, please use the microphones around the front table, so whoever sitting there. Um, and then um, if you sit in the back, please use these two microphones, because otherwise your voice will not be heard uh, for the video recording. So we'll begin with the Arnold first and then go back to the outstations. This is really, for those who already attended before, it's usually unusual not to see uh, this room packed, as, as you know from previous sessions. I attribute that to the timeline, if people are already thinking about PCSs and move, movements, et cetera. And, uh, but uh, the, the good news is, I can see we have multiple outstations already connected through <coughs> CJC Facebook Live, and VTC. So having said that, uh, when we receive uh, the questions for, through Facebook Live, CJC Facebook Live, Mr. Sals will be reading those questions to the panel. And accordingly, through VTC, they can ask those questions directly or make a comment. So with this, uh, we will begin with the Arnold and then go back to the outstations and back and forth trying to balance it. Who has the first question or comment from this room? So I forgot to just to say one last thing. The session today is conducted in English. Is that OK? All right, please. <laughs> Introduce yourself. I'm Phil, Phil Holtquist. I'm with the School of Advanced Military Studies. Uh, this question, I think, should apply to everybody, but I, it kind of mixes the last two. So uh, when people think about the BRI, uh, a lot of folks, especially in the military, see the security implications of that uh, and worry a lot about infrastructure and power projection and all those things that make us very insecure that might lead into the security dilemma that Colonel Mustafa is talking about. And so I'm kind of curious about your interpretation of it. Is the BRI, or are there certain aspects of the BRI that we should see as, um, as a sort of in a security sense, uh, making us less secure? That have to be, that have to be countered in some security sense, or or does that perception that Colonel Mustafa is talking about, the lens that we see it, are we just seeing this in a security lens, and then that's feeding a negative cycle um, of 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 some, the more negative competition? Thank you. Who would like to, to reply? So uh, yeah, I think there's absolutely things about the BRI that we need to be concerned about when it comes to our own uh, interest in, in security. Uh, when, when I say that, I mean uh, in specific regions and so forth. If you think about the security of uh, trade moving through the South China Sea, things of that nature. Um, and of course, we, we have you know U.S. Seventh Fleet there, and, and major uh, interest in securing waterways, uh, and uh, the militarization of islands in the South China Sea is is in some regards uh, a threat to that, uh, and uh, I think that's why you've seen, uh, for example, you know the Quad announced to, to try to. Um, you know, form form a relationship that that stands kind of against uh, any uh, any blockages that might occur there. Uh, but even in regards to BRI specific infrastructure, uh, if you think about the ports in the four countries that I mentioned, Pakistan, uh, or Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, and Cambodia, you know, there's some academics that r basically one academic has, has specifically has defined those as what he, what he called strategic pivots. Um, 
basically ports that serve both combined commercial and military purposes. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see if some of those make the, uh, the leap into actually setting up Chinese naval bases. Um, and I, I would argue that, um, you know, those countries that we talked about that are most dependent upon China um, and most indebted to China are the places where you're probably most likely to see uh, a Chinese naval base uh, established in Southeast Asia or South Asia. Um, but even as just strategic pivots as, as defined serving, again, military and commercial purposes, uh, I think they, uh, they certainly uh, allow China to better project its power uh, in the region and beyond, so. Anybody else from the panel? Yeah. So I think it's important to recognize up front when you think about the countries that are signing on to the BRI, um, they, they have agency, right? Like they're not a bunch of 18 year olds with their very first credit card who are just running around like, oh, I have free money, right? Like I, th I, th I think they're aware that the investment comes with some certain quid pro quo. Um, are there parts of that that perhaps they're kind of overlooking because they just want to get access to that cash? Absolutely. I mean, that's the reality that they're living in, right? Like these are countries who are in the developing world. They have desperate need for infrastructure development. They have desperate need for economic investment. Um, and in the absence of something else, that's what they're going to do. So I think one of the really pleasing changes, and, and hopefully we, we, we can learn a little bit more about it sooner rather than later, you know, up until very recently, it was basically a case of, you know, hey, don't sign up to the BRI because it's bad for your security, it's bad for your country. But that's it. Um, so uh, relatively recently, the Biden administration announced the Build Back Better World, the B3W. Um, there could be in this, you know, an alternative option, right? So if you're not going to offer, if, if the West is not going to offer an alternative option, um, I think it's somewhat unfair of us to rely on the fact that we're just going to keep calling China out. Um, if you want to compete with China in that space, we're very able to, but we need a system that allows us to do that. Um, and hopefully that's what we're going to see out of the Build Back Better world. Um, focusing on the region itself, uh, I think what is interesting to see, particularly around the security aspect of it, is um, for quite a long time there was kind of this um, acceptance that hey you know China economic realm that's your that's your game security West US that's kind of your game and both parties kind of putted along in that way uh, which I think is why the, you, you're seeing such a such a stark reaction with the recent signing of the Solomon Island Security Treaty because this really for the first time is you know, this is China now trying to play in the security game, right? Um, most of the work that they've been doing inside of that space has been largely captured under the auspice of economic, and now they're trying to really break into that security world. Um, you know, is that a response to the US and the West coming out and saying we're going to start playing more heavily in the economic space? I don't know. Um, but, you know, certainly you can see that there's now starting to be a little bit more spread of what we would consider to be competition outside of the two traditional spheres of accepted influence. Okay. Just add one, one yeah, thing. Yes, Mr. Mark. Just to add one thing to that, um, you know, China's great, I, I think, at, at filling vacuums. And, uh, you know, for, for years they had argued for existing international lenders to focus more on infrastructure investment. And I think from what I've read to a large degree, those requests fell on, on deaf ears. And then you see China step in and establish, for example, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, so again, I think, you know, you think about power vacuums and so forth, but there's, there's, there's other kinds as well where you have opportunities to step in and do something that's positive uh, uh, globally or for a region. And if, uh, if the international community um, doesn't make an effort in that regard, then you have others that are willing, or we don't make an effort in that regard, then there's others that are willing to step up. And I think, I think the AIB is an example of that. And it's, of course, a fairly small funder when it comes to BRI projects, but it is one funder. Could you come? Uh, I would like to step in right in what 
just uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa said regard, regarding what has, has the West to offer. So, and I'm talking from the European perspective. So, uh, European Union member states as well as the European institution has seen the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative as a, as a challenge and as a problem. Because some, even some European nations signed some memorandum of understandings with China regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. So there were six nations, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, Portugal, Italy, and Greece uh, signing up this memorandum of understandings. And of course, it plays into the narrative of China, right? So that even European nations, member states, signed up with this initiative. So the head of states tasks the European Commission to come up with an approach, with a different own approach regarding such a project. And this happened last year. So the European Union launched last year, 2021, the so-called Global Gateway. So this is now the kind of the counterpart regarding the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And it's uh, also the more or less the European offer for connecting the world with investments and partnerships. So and it's mobilizing 300 billion euro by 2027. So it's an amount of money which will be mobilized for this project, developing global infrastructure. So again, the same approach like the Chinese and supporting green and digital transitions. And there are five investment priorities within this project. It's uh, the digitalization, climate and energy, transport, health, education and research. But what is different are the guiding principles of this project from Global Gateway. It's different from the Chinese approach because it, it's emphasizing equal partnerships. Because we have seen in the Belt and Road in Initiatives this kind of predatory landing, you know, trying to get uh, influence in the political uh, way using this initiative. Then good governance and transparency. Um, uh, then, um, of course, democratic values and uh, high um, standards regarding this approach. Re 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 this approach, again, it comes back to tr uh, transparency. And, um, uh, and these key guiding principles are outlined in this program and will be supervised by the European, Com European Union Commission. So the, 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 the chairwoman, Ursula von der Leyen currently is in charge supervising this project and this, this money is well spent. So this is more or less from the European perspective. Hey, the, uh, the consideration we have to offer, especially for states in Africa, in developing countries, we have to offer something to counter this Chinese narrative. Thank you so much. Such a fascinating discussion, right? Everybody agrees with that so far? Thank you so much. Now, as we promised, we're going to, uh, next would be to our stations. We get a question or comment from there, and then we'll com come back to the Arnold. Mr. Sars will read that question or comment to you. Mr. Thank Sars. you, Dr. I. Uh, we have a question from Facebook Live. Other than climate issues, one of the other potential areas for cooperation where the West shares interest with China? Excellent. Who would like to begin with the answer? Yep. Colonel Mustafa? Yeah. Please. So I think I think it's important to understand when we talk about climate change, climate change is a a systemic problem. So it's not just oh hey, things are getting warmer and we're getting more bad weather. It, it has an effect on every single aspect of the globe. So what you have is, for example, um, increased interaction between peoples and pests, which increases the likelihood of pathogens transferring, which increases the likelihood of another event similar to the one that we're just coming out the backside of, COVID-19. Um, you have huge impacts on food security, and food security Interestingly, is becoming a far bigger issue, you know, particularly if you go and have a look inside of China. Um, it's certainly making its way up the priority list um, within the five-year plans coming out of the Politburo. Politburo. 
Food security itself, that also leads to increased tension inside of countries. When you have increased tension inside of countries and that leads to issues of government, governments then potentially get overthrown and certainly if you look at some of the um, events that took place inside of the Middle East over the last uh, decade and, and a bit more, um, the la food security has, has played a huge role inside of the instability that existed there. When that occurs, you then start having um, a lack of effective governance. That lack of effective governance then creates space for non-state actors, malign non-state actors to move into, creating greater problems in the terrorist environment. Um, on the more visible weather effects that come out of climate change, you then start getting areas becoming more inhospitable. As those areas become more inhospitable, you then start having more and more mass migration. Mass migration obviously leading to significant security issues for the countries that are trying to secure their borders. So I think it's important to understand that climate change is a far bigger issue than I think we give it a lot of credit for. And a lot of the issues where we have uh, overlapping or mutual interests actually come out of climate change. So you can think of climate change as kind of like the fountainhead of all of these other problem sets that we're having to deal with. So you know, out of all of those other issues that I just listed, they are issues that are a shared interest to the West and to China. And you could try and treat them individually as they come up. But the problem is that you're treating the symptoms of it. You're not treating the actual cause of it. Thank you so much. Colonel Kopp, please. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I try to lay out the, this, the triangle um, with this multifaceted uh, approach from European perspective as partner, competitor, and, um, and systemic rival. And uh, as I mentioned, as a partner, um, where we have mutual interests with, with China, I think also China is interested to keep Iran under the nuclear threshold. So perhaps we can also use this uh, discussion to stay in contact and ex exchange view and work in this in this uh, sensitive environment uh, then of course even per probably we are not on the same sheet of music probably we can use and we are interested to, to use the leverage of China towards North Korea as well um, and then um, we have seen during the COVID pandemic probably not the last pandemic we will face in the next decades there is some health issues we should work together to become more effective when we are fighting um, such pandemics and of course even china has a specific approach towards uh, working within international organizations which should use the platforms uh, from united nations other international um, organizations to bring them effectively to work and trying to get China into the boat to, um, to generate um, some added value with these international organizations. Thank you so much, Mr. Kapp. Yes, Mr. Amabli, please. So just briefly, um, I think there's lots of potential areas for cooperation, um, some of them uh, publicly seen others are most many yeah, many behind the scenes but if you think about human trafficking wildlife trafficking drug trafficking there's certainly some mutual interest there um, health related concerns disaster response you mentioned the relationship of, of some of these to, to climate change that being one uh, even on the law enforcement and corruption side um, although that gets into a sensitive area where sometimes you see China going after individuals for political reasons as opposed to uh, actual actual crimes, but there there's there's real law enforcement issues. I think where we can cooperate as well. Uh, so those would be a, a few additional a few additional points of cooperation. Yes, and, Colonel Mustafa. And please. if I could just add, I think as you look at COVID nineteen as a as a case study, so here's a perfect example of an issue that should have led us towards cooperation, right? This is a global pandemic. It's affecting everyone inside of the world. And because of how far we are into the negative competition space, we were unable to come together over this. So we descended into vaccine diplomacy, blame shifting, you know, stockpiling of PPE. 
using that to coerce you know, uh, support out of different countries. So I, I think that's an exemplar of, of how, far we are, how far away we are of uh, being in a position where we can make this relationship more positive. And that, for me, is quite alarming. Yes, Mr. Mobler. I'll just add one more thing. One more thing in that regard. Um, you know, I mentioned, as mentioned, that I served in Wuhan uh, previously. And uh, I was there in 2017, or 2016 to 18, and in 2017 had met actually with the Provincial Center for Disease Control and Health and Family Planning Office uh, in conjunction with their uh, Provincial Foreign Affairs Office. And, uh, you know, I can tell you that. Chinese capabilities in terms of uh, epidemiological surveillance had improved significantly since 2003 when you had the SARS epidemic. The problem, of course, was one of the big changes that had occurred between uh, then and, uh, and the current times is that you have many more people within the Chinese government that are less likely to be willing to kind of stand up and speak out on things because it's kind of the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Um, so even, even getting meetings like that has become much more difficult uh, for U.S. diplomats in China nowadays compared to what it was in the past. But I, I think when you think about coronavirus and so forth, I think part of the issue was is that there's a reluctance to speak up, and when people do speak up, they do get hammered down. And, uh, and you see, of course, delays with the world learning about things to the extent they should because of that. Um, but I'll, in saying that, I'll, I'll add that at the, at the working level, frankly, most Chinese officials I've interacted with have been quite professional. But again, they're, they're operating in a system where they feel like they have to be more and more cautious. Thank you so much. You see, the, the stores generate other stores and become very, very interesting discussion. That's amazing. So I, I'm suggesting to viol violate a little bit balance because we have two people standing at the mic. We'll go to two questions or comments from this audience, and then we'll take two questions or comments from our stations. Dr. Dahlstrand, the next you, please. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Kate Dahlstrand from Army University Press. And I guess I'm looking for maybe an Australian and European uh, perspective. I keep coming back to this, uh, one of the, your point about one of the few points of cooperation between the United States and China is climate change. And so I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is, because both nations have been largely criticized for making insufficient promises about uh, how they're going to address climate change, and it kind of seems like a convenient cooperation when America can point to China and say they're not doing enough, and they can point to their peer competitor and say the United States is not doing enough. And so I guess as a, as a point of cooperation, it almost seems like a wink and a nod at each other saying we can both commit bare minimum. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering when nations in Europe are spearheading and providing the golden standard of how to incorporate uh, ecological changes to how things are done, um, what they see when they see this one point of cooperation between the United States and China based on a mediocre response to the needs of you know, the Earth system right now. Any preference to which particular speaker? Or to I mean, I would be interested in all of that. Uh, anybody would like to begin with, please? Yeah, I can. Colonel Mustafa, please. Uh, I, I can start. Um, so, I, again, I, I, I want to try and stress the point that it's, it's one thing, but it's a really big thing, right? Um, or it could be. So, for example, if you go and have a look at the um, Interim National Security Strategic Guidance, um, it talks about climate change. Uh, it says that it's one of the priorities. But the priorities are not prioritised. Um, and if you go back to the previous administration's national um, security strategy, climate change is mentioned once. Um, and it's linked to economy. 
So I think th what, what we're seeing from this administration is a, is a big leap forward. I think the challenge that you have is, well, it's a couple of fold, right? So number one is obviously every country is responsive to its domestic audience. Um, and I think that's why, although there was expected to see quite a lot of policy change occur when the two administrations changed, what we saw was um, probably a, a lot more continuity than, than a lot of certainly external countries expected to see. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you've got a domestic audience who sees things through a certain way um, and until that changes it's really difficult for the, the leadership to make big decisions particularly when you've got a, um, you know, a, a political environment in Congress that's so close, right? right? Sorry, uh, and it's been interesting to watch. So my press is getting ready to uh, start working on a manuscript that looks at climate change and national security. Um, and the buildup towards this eventually being published has been intense because there aren't very many uh, government sanctioned federal documents that discuss it in the way that it's being discussed here. Um, that said, the author, Dr. Albert Palazzo, out of the Defense College in Australia, mm -hmm. is an environmental historian, and he points to specific moments that are able to change how a society and its leadership address an, a situation, and he kept pointing, going back to the wildfires in Australia as an impetus for acknowledging and developing systems to put into place uh, in preparation for this. Um, but he also points out the, the serious shortcomings thus far when you look at promises made by both China and America and so I just think it's interesting that they agree with each other, but they're still both highly criticized on an international scale. Yeah, so I guess two, two points to kind of close out, you know, my response to you. Um, the, the first one is it's, it's, it's incredible how bipartisan and, and not just America or right, Australia as well, uh, how bipartisan it's become at the government level when you mention China, um, but then when you mention climate change, how quickly it becomes extremely partisan. Um, so yeah, uh, like it's a challenge. Um, and, and having more conversations like this, people putting out more um, reports and research around it, it, even if it only impacts one or two of the politicians, like that's still a level of micro change that over time can achieve macro change. Um, and then I guess you get to this point. So, you know, when I talk about this with a lot of my colleagues here, um, the response is generally like, oh, well, you know, China's not doing enough. So, you know, why should we be the ones that have to suffer to, to lean into climate change? And I guess, you know, my response is, as much as China is rising and growing, America is still the superpower, right? And so, you know, to trot out that tired and old Thucydides analogy around the fear in Sparta, not the rise of Athens, you know, in this instance, I think in some ways it's actually a, upon the US to be the one who actually takes the first step to bring the two parties together. Um, because as much as you can see in a lot of the academic research that's out there that China really sees as the problem and in many ways is feeling the effects of climate change far more than the US is, um, at the moment we are trapped in a security dilemma um, and we are far, far along on that negative competition scale. So someone has to be the one to come forward and I would offer respectfully to the US that it really needs to be you. Anybody else from the panel? Kuroka, please. Yeah, I mean, you, you asked uh, specific, specifically also from the, for the European perspective again. So, of course, so European Union has really um, ambitious goals regarding climate change. So the official statement is that the continent should become climate neutral by 2050, so within 30 years. And uh, there's a long way to go still. Um, 
And of course, this is really complex because the European Union has sovereign nations as member states. And of course, you can see that there are different approaches. So for example, France is relying heavily on their nuclear power plants. They're even increasing the number of uh, nuclear power plants. So Germany shut down or will shut down every nuclear power plant. So we are relying uh, in the future just on uh, sonar, uh, solar and, 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 and windmills. And um, hopefully, if Putin is not you know, putting the, the gas down with some uh, gas, gas uh, to uh, power plants. And uh, Poland is still relying a lot on, on coal power plants. So, and to come together is already very, very difficult with uh, this amount of member nations with different approaches, different economic situations. Now coming to China, of course you have to recognize also China is, I, I pointed out on my slide, 1.4 billion people. And China is not only this shiny, uh, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, there are also the rural areas where they are not far away from a third world country. So electrification is important and therefore there is, I can see in China, and therefore there is this complex negotiations going on between the European Union and China regarding climate change, because on the one side you see they are building every year a certain amount of coal-driven power plants, which has, an, of course, regarding emissions of carbon dioxide, a huge impact on climate change. On the other side, you see relatively regarding elect electrification of cars, you see a kind of a, a really vigorous approach in China it's subsidized and uh, huge numbers of electrified cars are sold every year in, in China. And, um, and, and therefore, I, th I see, and, and it was mentioned, I think, by you, that uh, China is also interested in climate change. The population is interested in climate change because they are well aware that 1.4 billion people the approach in Europe or like in the US that everybody owns two or three cars is not sustainable if you look at the sheer numbers of the population. So you have to do something against it to reduce the uh, emissions. But as I, as I mentioned, it's, I think it's really complex and you should take into account the specific situation of China with their number of populations and the different levels of development within the country. But I mean, Mr. Mobley is certainly more, uh, has more expertise regarding this like, like, like I have. Mr. Mobley, please. Well, I'm, I'm no expert on climate change issues, but I can tell you again from, from time serving in China that, uh, and, and frankly, uh, different places in Asia that one, one thing that the uh, U.S. embassies and consulates have made a practice of in recent years is actually putting air quality monitors on our embassies and consulates and having it on our website, uh, what the air quality is in the area where we're at, um, which kind of in some ways held countries and towns and so forth to account. Um, in Wuhan, for example, while I was there, uh, you would you would see actually the Chinese government, the provincial level, the city levels, would have their own air quality monitors. Um, and folks could, you know, could actually compare and so forth. But uh, uh, based on my recollection, uh, the uh, the monitoring that was going on at that time was was accurate and, and in line with with what we were seeing as well. Uh, but yes, ab absolutely, uh, climate change is something that the, the Chinese are concerned about. But I would say uh, what they're most concerned about is. Uh, again, continued economic growth and, and the ability to, to uh, continue improving their lots in life and so forth. So, Excellent. Thank you so much. Anybody else on the panel? Great, great. Now, we, uh, as, as mentioned before, we're taking another question from this audience. Sir, please introduce yourself. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Tirda Dai. I'm with the Office of Dean of Academics. So China's BRI initiative has grown its original uh, regional corridors to all corners of the world. Its scopes now includes the digital, digital silk, silk Road telecommunication network, artificial intelligence capabilities, cloud computing, e-commerce sur surveillance technologies. Also, 
the Health Silk Road, um, which designed to um, China's vision of global health governance. So my question to you is how U.S. and ally partners can improve their competitiveness to meet the need of developing countries and bring public awareness to the economic and environmental cost to certain uh, BRI projects. Is it clear? The question is clear. Who would like to begin? Mr. Marble, please. <laughs> So I'll, I'll just sort of build on what I stated earlier, and that is, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of places, particularly if you look at countries that are in China's near abroad, where what they're building primarily is, is linkages, whether it's pipelines, railroads, and so forth, uh, between bordering countries and themselves. When it comes to that sort of infrastructure, I, I don't see us uh, competing in, in that region uh, in the same way. Um, just the w same way if we were building dramatic uh, infrastructure connections between the U.S. And, and our bordering countries. I don't see China being able to come in and compete in the same way. But I think we can come in on the sidelines of some existing projects that are taking place, do some of our own, but, but more importantly or most importantly, uh, to be, uh, again, a transparent actor that uh, abides by good business practices and can set a good example and come in and focus on projects that help build local capacity um, because that's a good offset to a situation where you often have uh, host governments, host uh, country citizens complaining that, you know, about BRI projects that are only really resulting in employment for Chinese that are brought in to work on the project are only really benefiting Chinese companies that are supplying all the equipment and materials. Um, so, you know, I think there's opportunities for us to uh, to offer a good, not a complete alternative, to, but a partial alternative to what, what uh, BRI partner countries are seeing from China. Excellent. Anybody else? Mr. Uh, Colonel Mustafa, please. Yeah, so I think to add to your question, um, I'll use like Huawei as an example. Okay, so um, China started rolling out the Huawei network. Everyone was trying to upgrade to 5G. Um, the West primarily the US came out and said, oh, oh, don't do that, don't put that in your networks, it's a huge security risk. Now for some countries, so Australia, relatively privileged, we were able to afford to pursue a different option, so we were able to spend the extra money to establish the level <coughs> of security that we were looking for. But for a lot of other countries, they don't have the ability to make that choice, right? So if we want to call out Huawei as being a security threat, don't put that into your comms network, we can't really do that if we don't have a viable, economically viable alternative to offer them. Um, now, I think to your point, though, there is a lot of room for positive competition in this space. So, you know, um, Colonel Kopp spoke about the European initiative that's trying to move in and provide more support to developing countries. We, you know, build back better world. I would expect is going to do something similar as well. So this, this could be positive competition, right? It's like, hey, we're going to work to compete with each other to provide support to the countries across the world that need it the most. That's great. Um, and in doing so, we're then having that positive change. And you're still able to compete, but you're competing in a positive way rather than just trying to call out every single bad thing that you see going on. Thank you so much. Anybody else from the panel? Excellent. Is that answers your question, sir? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as promised, we're going back to the outstations. Mr. Sells? Dr. I, uh, Bruce Roeder asks, any discussion on short-term and long-term effects of the recent agreement between China and the Solomon Islands, particularly on the U.S. position on the security of Taiwan? And is that an indicator of what's likely to be next? So it was addressed to Dr. Rai, so now I'm <laughs> just kidding. So please, who would like to begin with? Um, Mr. <laughs> Colonel Mustafa, you, I, I, I can see that you're initiating, and then Mr. Marble maybe will that. So the security agreement is, is really, is, is, is the, the ink hasn't even really dried on it yet. So I think it's potentially a little bit early to be 
trying to pull out, you know, here are all the relevant lessons learned that we're going to be able to grab from um, what's occurred. Uh, I guess what I would, would do is, you know, go back to my previous point around the um, what, what was occurring over the last kind of decade plus around the split between, you know, economic partner of choice, China, security partner of choice, US, West. Um, so what I see, and again, this is not the position of the Australian government nor the Australian Defence Force, um, what I see in this appears to be uh, China starting to move more into that security partner environment, which is obviously why it appears so alarming. Um, is this a trend that's going to uh, occur more broadly across the region? I don't know. I think, you know, obviously they're going to see how the dust settles, the reaction to this occurs. Um, but, you know, China's got presence in a lot of the countries throughout the region, um, certainly in Vanuatu, heavily in Papua New Guinea, and most of it at the moment under the auspice of economic cooperation. Um, but as, as potentially as they see the US starting to lean more into economic development or economic competition inside of the region, um, so uh, I'm the recent Indo-Pacific strategy that got released spoke about an economic framework for the region. Um, obviously, it's not the CPTPP because that domestically it doesn't have traction. Um, but if, you know, if you're looking at this through a China lens, it's like, oh, okay, so now you want to compete in the economic space. Well, okay, well, no worries. Then maybe we start playing in the security space. So, um, as I said, I. I think it's a little bit too early to determine exactly what all the lessons learned that are being taken away from this instance is. Thank you so much. Mr. Mobley, please. I don't know that I have anything to add. I think uh, Lieutenant okay. Colonel Mustafa's uh, points were right on target, and I, I'd agree that, uh, one, I think it is a little early, but two, it's, it's, it's not something I've looked into deeply, so I'd be a little reluctant to, to comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Colonel. Okay, great. All right. So. As promised, we're going to the second question to our stations, and then we'll go back to Arnold. Mr. Sells. All right. So the next question from uh, Facebook uh, listeners is that fundamentally China remains a communist country, and the West is composed of liberal democracies. How much does this impact our ability to cooperate with each other? Is this really a factor? Who would like to begin? Interesting question. Distinguished panel, who would like to begin with the answer? I'll go first. Colonel yeah. Mustafa, please. Yep. Um, so I think it would be very unliberal democracy of us to think that just because they're not like us, we can't work with them. Um, that kind of, in some ways, like flies in the face of what it, the, the values of a liberal democracy. Um, and I guess I, you know, I circle back to one of the points I made earlier around that virtuous cycle of cooperation. So there are a lot of things that we don't see eye to eye on with China um, because they have a different values space than the West does. Um, but if you want to achieve some kind of common ground on those, I think you need to start in an area where there's a significant amount of mutual interest and then hopefully by learning more about each other, learning to understand each other better, you can then spill over into other areas. So simply calling China out over and over again for human rights issues, I think is a suboptimal approach to achieving any real change on human rights issues. Um, and so I'll, 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 I'll borrow a lesson that I learned from a, another uh, activity that I'm gonna take. So I'm a CrossFit coach. Um, and when you're coaching someone in CrossFit, and you're giving them cues, you're trying to get them to change something that they're doing, right? Now, you'll say something to them, and they may pick it up, and they may make a change, or they may not. And if they don't make a change, there's very little point saying the exact same cue that you just said to achieve the change that you're looking for, right? Like, you need to find a different cue. And so, where there are areas where there's, where there's a value mismatch, if you go in through interests, then you likely find yourself in a situation where you may be able to find other cues to find more common ground when it comes to values. Um, and I think it's important to understand from a Chinese perspective, uh, you know, they've studied why it is that the 
Soviet Union fell apart, right? And, and one of the big glaring problem sets that they look at is two of the big policies that um, Mikhail Gorbachev brought in, right? Perestroika, Glasnost, right? Glasnost was all about increasing transparency, opening up discussion around political and social issues, and that to that to, to the China lens, certainly from a lot of the academic writing that's coming out of there, that is one of the chief reasons why the Soviet Union was dissolved, right? Why the, why the Communist Party inside of the Soviet Union was no longer able to be effective. So I think we just need to be very careful about how much we're going to want to try and push them towards being more like us, vice how much we're willing to try and understand each other a little bit more and find a place to cooperate over because the, the Chinese Communist Party is unlikely to transform itself into a liberal democracy. I think, you know, it's 50 years this year since Nixon and Kissinger went in with that goal in mind, and it hasn't worked. So I think we need to find a way to cooperate across the lines of uh, two different political systems that both have their own merits and are both seen as being highly effective by the countries that utilise them. Thank you, Colonel Mustafa. Anybody else? Oh, yes, Mr. Mabu. Um, so I'll just say, well, one, you know, China is an authoritarian government with a mixed economy. Uh, they pulled uh, millions of people out of poverty because of their adoption of a lot of capitalist principles and so forth. Um, so just want to state that, state that right off the bat. Uh, one thing I would say that, you know, I served in China twice uh, with about a 15-year gap between those assignments. And there's a big change between those two time periods, not, not only in, in terms of the development that's taken place in China, but the willingness of working level officials in China to cooperate with, uh, to interact with even uh, U.S. representatives uh, at that level. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, very humble, very willing to engage with you, very inviting. Um, you know, when I went back in 2016, frankly, uh, timid, somewhat afraid to interact with the Americans for fear of being seen as too close to the Americans. Uh, those that would like to, you know, cooperate with you on something were, were reluctant and others were just unwilling, you know, from the start because they knew it could be perceived negatively within their own government. So uh, in that regard, cooperation has changed dramatically where I think, you know, cooperation can still occur quite well. I'm not saying it can't occur, occur sometimes at working levels, but Right now, I think it generally has to be, um, has to have the approval uh, of high, very high levels um, to happen uh, because, again, people at the lower levels, uh, what used to be commonplace, ordinary kind of interactions, how they see as something that could potentially get them in trouble. Let's uh, could you call, please. So in, in, in recent years, you have seen the discussion based on this uh, dramatic development and economic growth. China has seen that there was a discussion, is this uh, world gravi gravi gravitating towards China as a kind of a competing model to the, to the, to the Western democracies. And um, this kind of one party with this uh, enormous uh, economic success seemed to be a kind of a compelling alternative to, towards our system. Um, however, and I, now I have to come back at least as a German officer at, uh, once with Clausewitz. So the, the center of gravity is certainly the Chinese Communist Party. And there is, at least this is my interpretation, a kind of um, a, a contract, a kind of a social contract that the one party rule in exchange for economic, economic growth and social stability, the population is accepting this in China, this one party rule. And I see, I mean, China is not kind of 10 feet tall. You could see this also during the COVID pandemic. So then there might be in the future, you could pr probably can see some cracks within this social contract. Uh, because as you can see how China is handling COVID uh, pandemic. So they have still this zero COVID uh, policy in place. And uh, following just the newspapers and also the academic debate, what's going on in, in, in China, they, this is called the white terror, based on you know the white closes 
all these guys uh, because they have this kind of strict and it's really terrorizing the, the population and the people are fed up with it. Then what you, you could see what there was uh, kind of considerable protest in Hong Kong and they have going back to more kind of state gu uh, guided uh, economic policies. Uh, they have seen some crackdown in certain private sectors which uh, will kind of uh, backfire towards them and uh, also more probably also support for Russia will backfire on, on China in the, in the mid and, and, and long run. So bottom line, I can see in China a kind of inter internally there is a kind of a tone of anger and despair based on COVID policy and the, the kind of the e economic, um, um, let's say, um, they, they have, don't have the numbers currently which we have seen a couple of years ago in terms of economic growth and also social stability. So it all comes back again to the center of gravity is the, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party are they are able to fulfilling this social contract about economic growth and social stability. If not, and if this is cracking, then Chinese uh, Communist Party is running into problems. Thank you very much. Anybody else from the panel? All right. Um, if I may, just a quick input. Um, the question was like, fun when I hear the terms, terms are important, right? Sometimes the fundamental is still a communist uh, country, right? and uh, the Chinese experts would correct me. When I hear that, uh, what this ideology is based upon? It's based on Marx, Engels, and then when the Soviet Union established a country which used to be called USSR in 1922, they added Len Leninism. So for decades I, li I lived in that country which used to be, to be a socialist country. That was the closest to socialism I was a soldier in that country. Uh, I was a s employee. I was a student before my Johns Hopkins education. So according to those three ideologies, five years plan, economic plan, strict, controlled by the central government, what happens after five years? Brezhnev would come with his lengthy speeches, would give the update. So economy is important according to all those ideologies, right? So what China done, it's a market economy with the centralized control, which is they call communist uh, you know, government. But again, what kind of uh, country is that? It's a confusion, maybe deliberately sustained by them to confuse everybody. Like I'm confusing everybody with my beautiful hairstyle. So. Um, you know, 100 years, years ago, I experienced that, and that was what used to be called socialism. Some other countries, you know, used to be closer to that society. So what kind of country is that, China, right now? Did they learn a lesson from the Soviet Union uh, and then reform that? Mao Zedong, I know, contributed to that, etc. Anyways, just a quick quick input, if that makes sense. So the questions from outstations. No more questions? Okay, we're going back to, uh, to the Arnold. Any questions from the Arnold? Sir, please. I'm Tira Dai with the Office of Dean of Academics. Uh, you mentioned Iran and China deals are raised a question for me, so that's my second question for you. So in March 27, 2021, last year, almost about a year ago, uh, Iran and China signed a 25-year agreement worth $400 billion, which is a strategic and economic partnership, what they call it, and it's pretty much in line with the BRI, okay? Saying so, China is also uh, Saudi Arabia's largest trade partner and Israel's second largest trade partner, partner which both countries consider Iran as geopolitical uh, threat to their national security, okay? And also at the same time, we have the current administrations trying to revive that Obama deal, the nuclear deal with the Iranian government. 
So a strategic partnership between China and Iran has serious ramification for uh, national security of the United States and our allies. How do you think uh, this uh, agreement that Iran and China sign will affect these negotiations, and what are your perspectives on that? If we don't have any questions. From the audience, please, to begin with. Colonel Mustafa, I can see, I can see your intellectual um, <laughs> energy coming out. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know the, the exact details of the, um, the agreement, um, but I mean, it, it comes back to this interest and values thing, right? So if there are mutual interests, you can still work with someone even if you don't share their values. And, you know, the West does that all the time. There are certainly many countries around the world that the West works with be over shared interests where our values don't overlap and line up. So the agreement covers uh, military cooperation, uh, renewable energy, infrastructure, even with the BRI, they're talking about the 976 miles uh, railroad that will go from northern Iran uh, to Europe and uh, also um, included in there, um, uh, again, uh, nuclear power, uh, infrastructure, high-tech, and military cooperation. Yeah, so, I mean, Iran's been under some pretty significant sanctions for quite a long time now. So, ov obviously, they have relatively significant economic needs that aren't being met because of the situation they find themselves in. Um, certainly from the West, we can see this as being something very different to, say, having economic investment in... Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or Pakistan um, because of the strategic issue associated with Iran from the Western perspective. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's China deliberately trying to push Iran towards being a nuclear weapons capable state. Um, I think, you know, as we spoke about earlier, if there's a vacuum and no one's filling it, they're probably going to go in and do that. I, I personally believe the agreement, $400 billion because we imposed one of the most expensive sanctions imposed to any country. Um, it will give Iran a breathing room, uh, signing that $400 billion deal. And also, uh, there are talks currently in place for uh, Iran-China Bank, so they can get around SWIFT and uh, banking sanctions that we have in place. So uh, those are also new development there. Right now, there are discussions between two countries. So, just when one of you mentioned Iran, I think it was Colonel Kapp uh, raised that question in my mind. Okay, anybody else from the panel? Any feedback or any, any reply? Excellent, great discussion. Thank you, sir, for your question and, and uh, comments. Anybody else from the audience? Yes, sir, please. Joe Donald Bain with the uh, Department of Joint Interagency Multinational Operations. So, um, uh, Mr. Mobley, I believe you had mentioned about China seeking to fill vacuums. Um, it made me wonder. So we've seen the creation of a uh, vacuum on their border with the precipitous withdrawal of the United States and our allies from Afghanistan. So I'm curious what the, for, with the panel, what you know, perceive, assess, will be the, uh, the power projection economic penetration uh, uh, implications for China into Afghanistan going forward, given the, the security implications involved and um, the estimated trillions of dollars of reserves of those strategic metals and minerals that, uh, that are in Afghanistan, but uh, have not, nobody can exploit them yet because of that security situation. Anybody to begin with, please, Mr. Markley. So don't, don't know a great deal on this, but uh, I, I did read an article recently following uh, the withdrawal and uh, about China uh, trying to ramp up relations pretty quickly in order to access uh, resources in Afghanistan. And I, uh, I've, I've you know, read other, other pieces uh, specifically about uh, the importance of, of not only Pakistan, which they've had a long uh, and positive relationship with in many regards, but but looking to uh, Afghanistan to play a, uh, a central role uh, in, in terms of a resource provider as well. So I know it's important to them. Um, they've, you know, even in, even in Pakistan, they've occasionally butted up against uh, some security 
challenges and so forth and um, and even there where they've had that positive relationship they've, they've overreached at times and Pakistan has pushed back and actually looked for some other funders so that they had a diversity of funds uh, for certain projects uh, so as not to be too reliant upon China but um, but yeah I think uh, in terms of how their interactions with Afghanistan develop over time the uh, you know the verdict is, is, is still out it's going to be a while to see what they're able to develop but I know they've had their eye on it for a long time and they're moving as quickly as they can to to access some of those resources from what I understand excellent anybody else from the panel if I may since nobody else just to add quickly um, so uh, and we discussed that a while ago uh, before withdrawal of the US from Afghan on the coalition force from Afghanistan China had already announced 52 billion project in Afghanistan uh, and uh, even before the withdrawal and that was the extension of BRI Belt and Road Initiative so just uh, for those who don't know uh, you would be surprised and we discussed it before how many even remote countries uh, China is covering in terms of this BRI extensions even South Caucasus it began from first from Georgia then Armenia Azerbaijan so then now they targeted Afghanistan with this so-called soft power. But again, the security situation uh, is, looks like it's getting worse, uh, it's worsening in Afghanistan. I don't know if it's going to affect China's uh, BRI in Afghanistan or not, but that was official announcement already made a while ago. 52 billion project. And we published the related uh, extensive paper as a castle in one of the NATO's main publications during our trip to Europe. So in detail, statistics, et cetera, et cetera. So just a, uh, another thing to add, we talked about the strategic cultures of countries, right? You notice that Russia is always making a lot of noise, like NATO getting closer to its geographical borders, they're beginning war. China is a little different. This is the, that kind of that pertains to the strategic culture. They would unlikely immediately, you know, uh, apply to military capabilities. They prefer through soft power, through economic trade means of expansion. That's what we've been seeing all these years, particularly since 2013 when the BRI was uh, initiated by China. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. A couple more things. One, China is very good about, and this predates 20, uh, 2013 and the BRI, but. Uh, China is very good about funding projects in countries that essentially add prestige and credibility to the hosting government, uh, whether that's presidential palaces or culture halls or African Union structures, I mean, whatever, you know, those types of things. They're very good about it and they label them very well. The other thing I think is important to note is there are tons of Chinese funded projects out there. Uh, that again predate BRI or, or are occurring after BRI was announced that aren't actually official BRI projects, but they're Chinese company funded projects, uh, private Chinese citizen, you know, investments, you name it. Um, and a lot of times people mix what is BRI and what is other Chinese funders uh, projects, but, uh, and often they'll come in together and, and, and work off one another. Uh, but I just want to make that point because there's a lot of things out there that are happening that are funded by, you know, Chinese entities that aren't BRI projects, uh, including in the resource sector. But most in the resource sector would be, you know, uh, more likely than not BRI related at least. That's a great point. And uh, by the way, this is one thing is confusing, not directly kind of, you know, being involved, but through other those entities. Another thing usually correct me if i'm wrong they're not giving cash for those projects they're loans providing loans what that means is dependency yes colonel Kapp, please and just a, a kind of a, a small facet probably we will see this in the future i recently read actually in the reader from uh, army yeah. university press the china reader a really interesting article where they is a link between the Belt and Road Initiative and arms sales. And so now Dr. Rai mentioned there is a 52 billion yes. uh, program running in Afghanistan. And my assessment is because 
you could see there are links between Belt and Road Initiatives and arms sales, Chinese arms sales. Perhaps we can see in the future, and we have closely watched what's going on, if now China becomes the arms sale provider for Afghanistan. So this might be also a kind of a link and creating a dependency and getting influence and leverage in this, in this area. Is there, yes, sir, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, to this issue uh, a bit already, but um, given that our approach, the West, NATO, failed in Afghanistan uh, across the dime, what what will we see China do differently to uh, avoid a similar debacle? I think one of the hallmarks of Chinese engagement is not to have the kinds of, of strings attached that the U.S. would have with our uh, you know, support and activities. Um, so the strings they might have attached uh, tend to be more access to resources and, and those sorts of things that uh, are part of the deals rather than any sort of change in governance or human rights, you know, those sorts of things. So, uh, so I think that'll be the, the primary difference you're going to see. They're, they're there for commercial and for security interest and, and not much else. Yeah. Okay. Is that answers your question, sir? Excellent. That's great discussion. Um, anybody else from the audience? So there are a lot of interesting information coming out about China, Russia, and uh, already certain things shaping that. But one, th uh, and I don't want to kind of talk about this bec because my personal opinion, and I could be wrong. But one thing I can tell you for sure that after this conflict, and that affects every everything. It affects China's relationship, China, China, uh, Sino-American relationships, and everything else, even Afghanistan, right? So the, the, the global and regional geopolitics are not going to be the same anymore. That's for sure. So in about five years, and we kind of uh, talked about that in the conclusion of that book uh, sponsored by Castle. So in about five, ten years, everything is going to be different. So China, but one thing I wanted to mention, just the last thing. We, we see China is growing economically, population-wise, etc. We're always talking about its economic potential. You look at the World Bank statistics, you look at the IMF statistics, I'm always looking at those. This is the Western sources. And then compare with regional sources. I think they're more or less accurate. So you can see a steady, steady growth of economic capabilities, which is important. This is the foundation. But one thing, you might never thought about that. We have never seen, historically, Chinese military capabilities in action. We've seen Japan, we've seen Germany, we've seen Russia or Soviet Union. But have the, has China proved how good they are in combat? It never happened, right? Korean War was different. Would you agree with the Co Korean War? They got involved. What else? There was the Chinese-Vietnam War. Ch Chinese-Vietnam yeah. War, yes. They, they clearly proved their military capability. But that was different. That was then. Is it? Anyways, it's just a question for, for, to think, food for thinking. I mean, we, we have a term, paper tiger, right? Yes. I think it's, you know, how, how recent context you want to talk about, right? Because um, certainly there are lessons learned that a lot of the partners who were operating in Afghanistan and Iraq for a long time were able to take away from that. But that's not LISCO. Um, so, yeah, the, the Chinese haven't fought in a large-scale combat operation for a very long time. Um, Neither really has the US or the West fought in a large-scale combat operation, certainly not against a peer competitor for a very long time. So, yep, there are absolutely certain battle-hardening aspects that come with some of the fighting that was going on in the Middle East until relatively recently. Um, but the vast majority of the work that we're doing in a LISCO environment is training, um, and the Chinese are doing that too. But in fact, they're leaning very heavily into that. So I, I, I understand the point you're trying to make, Dr. I, um, but I would challenge ourselves to make sure that we're 
trying to run the same level of scrutiny over our own capabilities that we're trying to run over theirs. Okay. Anybody else to add to the discussion? What's the military spending of China per national GDP right now? It's around 2%. How, how much? Around 2%. 2 and 6? No, 2. 2%. Uh, it's unlikely. It should be higher because Russian uh, military spending per national GDP is around 3%. Mm -hmm. It cannot be lower than that. So in the Soviet times, Soviet Union military spending was 4.5. Yeah. So now it's not even 3%. And we can see the results, what they're doing in Ukraine. A lot of failures, right? Even logistical failures, etc. So anyways, uh, it's important how much their budget and spending, etc. So anything from the outstations? Nothing? Or they're still coming in? I'm sure they're coming in, right? So let's talk about that real quick. So what if it's 2%? That's 2%. probably sufficient because they don't have global responsibilities or power projection that the United States does. Nobody else in the world can does what we do in terms of global protection. And their army, their great army, is all internally focused. What is the threat to the United States of the, so, or the Chinese invading our country? Hegemonic, from a hegemonic standpoint, maybe in the region, not a world global maritime power. Not an air force that's capable of power projecting going to do anything. NATO has that capability. We do, you, European Union. Chinese don't. They're domestically focused or in a very tight regional context. So 2% is probably sufficient. So what? Okay. Yeah. You can't look at it in the same context. Same yeah. with Russia. They're, they're, they have, their biggest global threat is only from their ICBM side. But from a power projection and going to fight somewhere, where are they going? You, yeah, Europe. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Europe, period. Yes. A yeah. contiguous yeah. place for them. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Greg, to your point, like, it's, 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 very, it's an accurate it's point. apples right? and oranges. 100%. 100%. Um, but also it's apples and oranges in so far as if the West wanted to force project into the region, there are huge overheads that come with trying to do that. So, you know, it, what, one of the most common things I see in some of the China electives we teach is we say to the students, you know, hey, let's do a contrast. And the first thing they do is pull up all of the US's capabilities and all of China's capabilities and go, oh, look, the US will be fine. It's like, well, sure, if you're going to take everything from across the globe and concentrate it onto that. But that's not what's going to happen. Nor, nor is there probably ever a risk that we're going to invade China. No, like zero. exactly right. Zero. Yeah. So it's a maritime air force fight in that region. Yeah. No, I agree. So despite the army's perceived doctrine, strong desire to strong be seen desire. as strong desire, strong desire to support <laughs> yeah. our other partners. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think you know, to Secretary Wilmoth's credit, she's been very clear about what army's priorities in that region are, and fighting some kind of um, conventional uh, crisis contingency engagement is one very low down the list amongst a range of other things that Army could bring to some kind of Indo-Pacific based challenge. So back to your point earlier about the climate change and the fact the US as a superpower should be the lead. So if China truly wants to be the superpower, what it lacks besides its own military power projection is it doesn't get involved in the world to go and do other things. Where's their humanitarian assistance? Where are they to support other nations in defense of anything? They're, they're not a leader. They just want to be an economic powerhouse. There's a difference between being an economic powerhouse and being a world leader. And China's not a world leader. Exactly. And one of the reasons, for example, like uh, now this Russia-Ukraine, I'm sorry for just a second, Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict is impacting even the Arab countries. Like I, I read the uh, in news about Lebanon, the food security, the hunger is rising. So China could contribute to that. For example, food security is a big issue right now, right? So they, they're not doing that. They're just expanding through BRI and trying to accomplish their national security objectives, but not accomplishing like this real, real help. You meant BRI economically makes them a powerhouse, but they're not leading anybody. As a matter of fact, they're alienating the very people yeah. through the BRI and the economic impact and the fact that it's Chinese laborers and they have perceived power over that education. USAID out of the State Department 
goes to places to help them. And it's a strategic interest to us because we want them to be viable and not be an unstable or failed state. But we don't go in there to rape, pillage, and plunder and put our own people in there to do their job. Colonel Mustafa, you wanted to add something? Mr. Mowgli, and then... Oh, Colonel, yes, Mr. Long. In terms of the BRI, I, I think um, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, I think there's places where they operate in a much more um, above board way, if you will, than others, because they have to in those countries, uh, those countries that are more developed and, and less uh, in need of, of just China being their provider of, of loans and so forth. So I, I think it's a mixed bag, and I think it would be wrong to characterize all BRI countries in kind of the same category or the way China treats them all in the same category. I think that would be, again, painting with too broad a, a brush stroke. Um, so anyway, that, that's the, the main thing that struck me there. Um, that the BRI is a great thing that they're doing economically for everybody. Another broad stroke. Say that again, I'm sorry. Your earlier point that their BRI and a great economic support to all these countries, a similar broad stroke, just on the other side of my broad stroke. That, the, that their economic support to other countries is a broad stroke? Your, your, your point, that it, you made a, a very favorable view of the BRI. Well, I, try I to see it as a mixed bag as well. Yeah, I would. Yeah, well, I don't think I. Uh, okay, I don't think I did that. I think I provided a balanced view, and um, I said it's good and bad, and we shouldn't paint it as all bad. Yes. Uh, we should be willing to criticize negative actions, and I think if you want to have a positive uh, perspective from your audience, the other countries in the world that are looking at you and China as competitors, you also have to be willing to praise some positive actions occasionally. So. Uh, I don't think that's painting with a broad stroke. Excellent. This is a great, I can sense this uh, intellectual energy back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> this is amazing. So, unfortunately, we have two minutes left, actually, right? And we, to, we need to wrap up. I apologize. Oh, usually it's endless. About 1,000 comments still coming in. Our stations are waiting. And so, but we need to wrap up the session, right? If the Arnold doesn't mind. Is that okay to wrap up the session? Excellent. So, next slide, please. This is some of our capabilities. Uh, please pay attention. We added some of our NATO capabilities. We've been lately very closely cooperating, right? This is some updates. Uh, and this is the across the country and globally. This is our active partners. And this is not a complete list of our active partners. So. If you go to the actual website, you can see more organizations. Now, these are, uh, next slide, please. The final slide contains our uh, website, Castle website. Uh, the video related information will be posted here as well as in other Army venues, okay, such as Army U, CGSC, Facebook, etc. right? So, for further educational purposes. On behalf of all of us, I would like to thank, and we are blessed with that always, our great panel for their insight, very insight and very knowledgeable uh, expertise. Thank you so much, great panel. We really appreciate that. So uh, the last point is, I, I can't fit here, so. Um, now. We have some castle sponsored and authored books here, and Dr. Kim mentioned that in the very beginning, right? If you are interested, you are welcome to take a copy with you, okay? So this concludes our session. We might see you on May the 25th in this room. Maybe, we, it's not for sure, uh, or maybe earlier. Uh, so thank you so much. That concludes the session. <laughs>